Um, so hello everybody, I am Kem, I am up again. Um, so today I will be sharing some of experiences um, that I had um, for uh, taking Pocky, the reference distribution that comes with Yocto, and um, use that into, you know, customize basically uh, that into a distro phone. And, um, uh, and you know, various um, uh, features that are there. They are not the only ones. There is a lot more to it. But I will cover the features that um, I customized. So, um, so this is uh, the, um, uh, the reference distro that comes with the Octo is the Pocky build system that uh, uh, Dave also mentioned in the morning. Uh, this is the uh, reference distribution that comes with the Octo project. Um, and um, there are certain uh, variables that are available, which are which define di various distro policies. And um, so, first thing you could go is you could um, um, essentially uh, take one of the standard distro configurations that uh, are part of uh, Yocto, essentially pocky.conf. This is the Pocky reference distro, um, LSB, um, again, and the tiny is uh, for the small footprint projects. So depending upon um, um, your project that you would like to work on, you could pick one of these or uh, more than one of these. And, um, and then we'll go through what we change to make it our own. Um, so these are the uh, variables that define certain parts uh, or, or identifying your distribution. So distro is a variable that defines your distro name. Um, essentially, it's, um, it's a weak define in Pocky distro. Once you take Pocky distro and define your own distro, you can rename it to um, something of your own. Um, distro name, again, uh, this appears in uh, various um, um, you know, mod D messages and all those things. And uh, the maintainer, uh, which gets into um, um, the package feeds and uh, the metadata that goes into packages. Um, so you can add that. A lot of information to maintainer that's uh, very helpful in pointing your uh, end users to, you know, write mailing list or um, person or whatever the website you want them to look at. Uh, target vendor, it goes into the, um, um, the, the, the middle part, the vendor part of the, the triplet, the GNU triplet. Um, so when you build your SDK, for example, and you, don't, you want to identify that with your distro, um, you, you could use a target vendor string. Uh, SDK vendor is very similar to target vendor. And uh, distro overrides, essentially. Uh, you can add your own override that are particular to your own distro. You might have certain features um, that are your distro specific that you want some metadata that you define later on to acknowledge. So you would add those uh, new um, overrides into your distro overrides. And uh, there are much more variables. If you go through that pocky.conf, there are more variables that are defined in there. And uh, I would certainly suggest that you, know, you know, look at that and customize that as, uh, as per your needs. And um, um, essentially, the uh, next thing is uh, adding your own layer. Um, so um, there is actually a sample file, bblayers.com. It has uh, uh, the standard layers that are part of uh, Yocto, uh, or rather the reference distribution that come with it. Um, so um, you would just append your layer to this one. Um, so I just call it MetaFoo. It could be something different. It doesn't have to start with Meta. It can be anything. It's just a name. Um, and you would just append it to there. And um, <clears throat> this will notify Bitbait to parse this layer for, uh, for uh, configuration and uh, metadata. Um, so uh, if you have to customize, say, your local.conf, um, for example, for some reason, you don't want to use Prelinker. And, 
Um, by default, Pocky's distro configurations, it uses prelink. So you would go about is you would define your own user class in your own local.conf, um, and you would omit the, for example, image prelink uh, from the user classes. That would avoid um, the prelink step um, when your image is being generated. So sometimes you know some some architectures you use prelink is not supported, or prelink has certain bugs. For example, that could be. Uh, not only to prelink, I just pick an example, but there could be more um, uh, that kind of situations where you know there is a feature you really don't want in your distro. Um, so you could define those also in your um, local.com sample. Essentially, when you use Pocky's um, uh, scripts, which is to you know start with setting up your local conf and all those things, it'll pick your changes from your local.conf.sample. And um, so uh, moving forward, um, if you want to build multiple BSPs, um, for example, if you have a uh, PowerPC uh, part and uh, another one is a Intel part. Um, so um, there are a lot of BSPs already available. I just picked one of those, um, which is not uh, default in in Yocto when you when you check out Yocto. Um, so say you want to add a machine that's available in Freescale's uh, BSP layer and another one from um, Meta Intel, uh, which is collection of all the uh, Intel BSPs. Say Crystal Forest, for example. So um, we just uh, uh, mentioned that you know you add the layers into BB layers um, variable. You would just add these three layers. Um, into into your BB layers .conf and uh, it will set up Bitbake to look into these layers for additional uh, metadata. Um, and this way, in yes. So core base is defined in um, um, in Bitbake .conf. Correct. Yes, that's right. So that's why you are modifying the sample file, because essentially then this sample file will be used to generate your eventual bblayer.conf. So during that phase, then this will be replaced with the relative path that you have uh, set up your uh, Yocto to be in. Um, so you have your BSPs, and uh, you know without doing any changes, now you can build for these machines using Yocto. Um, uh, once you add those layers, and uh, for example, if you build for, or you can choose your machine to be Crystal Forest, um, and uh, build you know standard images that are provided, because we haven't yet modified images, so you can build one of the standard images like Core Image Minimal. Or core image SATO, or um, you know any of other LSB images that are out there. Um, so the next thing is, you want to tweak the res the recipe. Um, so you might want to add, you know, certain bits, but not really overhaul the whole recipe. So you want to probably use it as it is, but there is an additional knit that you want. That's what the BB pens are for, generally. So BB pens are are patched by Bitbake. Essentially, it's parsed, the recipe is parsed, and then BB pens are added to it, and you know eventually that makes your complete recipe in the end. So um, um, so there is a mechanism to um, bump up the revision to show that you know you have a BB pen, and um, the PR ink this magic here essentially takes up whatever the but these things are, are actually were there when we had PR quite a bit. But now there is um, PR are, gen, uh, are auto generated. Um, so essentially, um, you know that will bump up the PR by one, uh, whatever the base PR of the recipe was. Um, so likewise, you can do this uh, little tweaks that you want to do um, in your own layer, of course. And uh, since your layer is parsed. It will be appended to the main recipe and acted upon by um, you know when um, when Bitpick parses it. 
Um, so many uh, many a time you want to change certain 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 things like you know maybe file layout or something like that. You could also overwrite uh, override those um, um, configuration data um, like file permissions and uh, so there is um, there is a file for um, creating files and associating permissions uh, for various directories and uh, you can go in there you can uh, adapt that to your own uh, file structure, if you will, and you can change those too. So it's it's very flexible from that point. Um, however, when you override configuration metadata, um, you have to always maintain that sync. Like you know, so you update to a next version of Hockey, and it has now few additional bits in there, and you know you have to sync your versions of configuration data, essentially. But <coughs> If you have BB pens, BB pens will just add to whatever changes are done in 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 the in the proper recipe. So uh, you already uh, get those changes, but if you override it completely, uh, then there there is that part uh, that can come you know bite you. So just be careful. Um, so yeah. Um, I think it really depends. Usually, um, it depends on like if. So the question is: Is it um, is it intended to modify it for both SOCs and machines? So essentially, it's not tied to any machine or anything. I just took an example. Um, it could be anything, and machine I took an as, uh, as an example, but SOC uh, override the SOC family override is one. Override that you could use. Yes, if say you know in a practical case you have um, um, a change that applies to many um, many machines that are based on same SOC family, and you happen to have a SOC override available for those, then you would go and change and you know override or use SOC uh, override to do the, that kind of um, changes. But it's case by case basis because you are tweaking it. You know best what you are tweaking it for. Okay. Yeah, sure, it is possible. Um, you could do that, like you know, there. Are, um, you could die, uh, write a uh, say. You know, you are trying to change a install, right? So you want to install a particular file, additional to you know whatever is installed. You will just write a do install and append and give it an override of your machine name, whatever machine you want it for. And essentially, that will just work for that machine. But be sure that what it would also do is it would change that recipe to be built for, say, you know, you have three different machines now, right? So it, the recipe becomes machine specific. So now it will be built um, separately for that machine, if it is a common, uh, common <coughs> recipe. So, if we have multiple layers, yeah. each layer has its own BBF pen. What is the expected behavior uh, for the, the for these two BBF pens? Um, so it depends, like what priority you have, and uh, so BBF pens are applied one after another. They are not uh, essentially they are. Uh, added one after another. They are not overridden per se. So it's not like you got five different layers doing BB appends, right? And so the last one is hold or something like that. It will append all of them. Um, so it's just like adding to the end of it, thinking that way. The order will be like depending upon like you know uh, how it is parsed. So if we are using like a standard uh, layer like meta OE, yeah. Right, so you could use BB mask or something like that to mask, uh, you know, say you don't want 
certain, say, recipe support, right? So you would define your BB mask for that, and then it'll, it'll, uh, Bitbake will ignore it. Yeah. No, I think they stack on each other. It should be always like that. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, that, uh, I think that implementation was totally different than what really went upstream into BitBake. And yes. So basically, it's, uh, Richard is saying the same thing, saying that, you know, the BB pens. So the question was that there was uh, a case when BB pens, it only took one BB pen. And then you have to specifically include it. So that was Monte Vista's case. So essentially, Richard was clarifying that implementation was uh, different. What went upstream always pens. All the BB pens it will find. So, um, so SDKs. So you know, we talked about workflow and SDKs a little bit. Essentially, SDKs. Uh, so there is a, a standard SDK that's provided in Yocto. So if you just do bitbake like meta dash toolchain, it will build a basic SDK, a C, C++ SDK for you. Um, and essentially, that's um, sometimes enough. Sometimes you want to add your own packages to it. Um, so you can customize it through BB pens. And that's what I've uh, essentially done is essentially I wanted to say boost in my uh, SDK for some reason, and uh, I went ahead and you know we changed say toolchain underscore target underscore task. This is one of the variables. You modify, you add the development package to that one, and it gets added to the um, uh, to the toolchain. So essentially, again, the toolchain I have done here is you know it's adding one or two packages. So essentially, it's okay to go by uh, a BB append. Uh, because you know, I want to reuse most of what's in Meta Toolchain and just add few pa few packages on top. Um, you can entirely go ahead and you know inherit this and then do a bunch of stuff like depending upon your own needs. If you want to add more stuff, um, you know you can write a new recipe and include this recipe in there and uh, and add stuff if you don't want to do appends uh, in your own layer and. Um, um, I've used uh, um, I've used uh, overrides here because there are certain parts I only wanted for specific um, uh, architecture, for example, and um, and then I also needed some host tools that are part of the SDK, uh, which is um, which will be used by the you know the end developers to get their job done. So essentially, you can uh, easily um, uh, customize the SDK uh, um, offering per se. Um, there is a new mechanism also, um, which is the uh, image SDK. So essentially, that's a very good use case. So you build your own image, and you want an equivalent SDK that matches your image. So um, it's uh, many times you have um, some of your own own infrastructure, right? You have your own APIs. That you want to share across teams, so you know you you have uh, a, uh, one group li writing a library that wants to be shared across um, a different group who has nothing to do with that group. Um, so SDK is a common ground where they can share their APIs, and other consumers of it can use SDK essentially to um, to use those APIs. So it's a very uh, very a very good thing, and uh, so if you have put up an image together, customized image together for your own target, you could just run a pop populate SDK task. And that essentially will generate an SDK installer 
that's equivalent to uh, that will have all the development and libraries and headers that are in the packages that are consisting of your customized image and uh, yeah you could bitbake likes both ways yeah So the question was, um, should there be a space between minus C and the option itself? And uh, so the answer is, you could use either. Um, it's bitbake parses both equally well. So you could use minus C space populate underscore SDK, or just one word, minus C populate SDK. Um, so um, next thing, we talked about shared state. And um, um, so the shared state is uh, one of the uh, very uh, um, good features that you could use to your own benefit. Um, for example, you want to build your own images, and you know you don't want people to be rebuilding all the time. Uh, one of the complaints you always hear is that oh, you know it takes an hour or you know two hours to build my image just for one tweak or whatever, right? Or so. We ended up setting up a shared state. And um, again, you would go in your own distribution. You will define your shared state mirrors, uh, where you want to host them internally, up to you. Um, what this will do is this will set up your you know, end customers who are building um, images to look for shared state here or the network. So that have reduced the build time essentially drastically and um, you know right now the the most time now it spends is in 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 building the image itself sucking in all the um, you know packages through shared state is pretty fast um, the whole um, process becomes a lot faster so generating an image becomes like a non-issue for developers now like even the application developers they don't notice uh, how, how how the image is being built so essentially uh, shared state is a good thing if you are, you know, we talked about the layers. There are certain layers, there are certain packages which are not shared state friendly. You can exclude them if you want to. Um, but, you know, essentially they have to be converted into, uh, to be shared. Yes? Can you give an example of something you can do in the metadata to screw up the shared state? Um, yes, I could. Um, so there is essentially a variable. Um, <coughs> I have set it up, but I don't want to, I mean, I didn't include it in here because I really don't like it. Because I would like to fix the package itself to be shared state friendly. Um, but um, that is not a supported model per se. So I think there is a, um, um, I, it's, it's escaping me. There is a variable that's available. Uh, you can set that, you can actually set that to zero. And then it will know that this recipe is not shareable. Oh, the bad case. Oh, so you want the bad guys? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So some things like if you hard code paths, right? Um, shouldn't hard code paths essentially don't depend upon say root FS location or tool chain location and um, make them relative if you if you, if you can and um, there are certain packages that are already uh, out there which hard code paths like library search paths or stuff like that and that will not unless you have the same build tree you know everywhere this is not going to work because Shared state is supposed to work in, in, in any top level structure, wherever you put it. So, yeah, so taking care of keeping your package relative will get you off any shared state issues. And um, um, so there are like um, packages, essentially, some, some layers which have certain packages, they already depend on those things, like. Meta Java, for example, has certain packages. 
And those packages have complex build system of their own, which depend on those things, right? So essentially, the good thing is they should be fixed, because it's wrong anyway to depend upon where you installed um, the package. But um, but yeah, it's good to write those kind of relative um, um, uh, relative paths. So, download mirror. Question on state. Yeah. So it appears it's not just dependent on the binary; it's also dependent on the uh, metadata. Right. So, like, if you change something very uh, minor in the recipe, like a description or something that is not really essential, so this will trigger a different state. I think it will, right? I mean, if you change recipe, right? If you don't change the recipe, then it will be fine. But uh, the oh, crikey, turn the volume right up on it now. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, the the the, recipe, the shared state. Um, works by hashes. So it takes some data and it builds up this hash that represents that particular shared state object. And it only puts the information into that hash that pertains to the particular task it represents. So it will, it's very sensitive to changes. So if you have a compile function and you change what's in that compile function, it doesn't know whether the output changes or not, so it assumes that it does and includes that. But if you have some comment in the file, it knows that the comment is relevant as long as it's not part of the actual compile function, and therefore it, it would ignore that. So it, it only puts the things that make sense into the hash. The, the checksum is, consists of all of the inputs that go in from the metadata. It doesn't know anything about the binary. Yeah, it, it, yeah it, it works on the inputs, not the outputs. Otherwise, you can't know in advance whether, the checks, whether a particular shared state package is relevant or not. It, it needs to know, in adv you know you, without building it, is this object good or bad? So it, it has to checksum the inputs, not the outputs. Right. No, it will trigger. It, it will because it, it yeah, it's based on no, the hash. It depends on well, so if you're fetching from a git, it depends on whether you set your git hash, your git rep, to be a fixed one or to auto rep. It doesn't it doesn't matter which. Even if it's set to auto rev, it knows which revision it built. By making a change to the upstream repository, you change it to a new git hash, and therefore it will yeah. you get a new shared state checksum. Yeah, yeah auto rev will always trigger it, um, irrespective. But if you have SRC rev set to a certain hash of your git tree, then you do, if you don't change it, then it knows that source hasn't changed. But with auto rev, it doesn't know. But there are like ways you can exclude certain variables that you know for sure doesn't uh, change the shared state. And then you can specify that in the recipe. So the next thing I was uh, going to um, go on was customizing the download meters. So sometimes, like you know, you yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you can uh, host. You are talking about where you are hosting the NFS state. Yes. So the the host distro 
specific um, shared state is stored in a version. So like, you know, it will know that your, so you built it on, say, Ubuntu 10.4, right? And you put it on a common server, and the other person is Ubuntu 12.04. He will not, he will know that, you know, the, the base was built for 12.04 12 12 and not for, say, a different version. So it will know it. I think it does handle. Um, you, you can put like various distributions. Uh, um, so the question uh, was that, you know, can it handle um, shared state for different build distributions on the build system? And yes, it can handle. Like, you know, if you put the right, if you put right kind of, um, so if you look into the, uh, how the shared state is organized, right? So you will have a host specific um, directory all the shared state for host specific uh, packages go under that. So you can have for CentOS, Ubuntu, or those. You can actually go a little bit cleverer than that, and you can map things as well. So you can say that a 12.04 can use something from 10.04 because libc is generally backwards compatible. But right. your 10.04 machine would not use the 12.04. So there's even a way you specify yes. it in the shared state mirrors. And we probably don't have a good example you know, in the, in the main repository, but you can set up mappings like that. And so I know people who use that. Yes. How would we do that, or where would we find the Just look at the shared state mirrors examples. We pr probably, you know, and, you know, even file a bug request and say, how do I do this? Because I, I know it is possible. It's been mentioned on the mailing lists and probably in some of the commit messages, but I don't know whether it's been well documented. So, yeah, just remind us we need to document it. Yeah. In theory, yes. In practice, the network access time tends to cause the problem. So right. you'd spend an hour downloading the shared state files rather than doing the build. So you, you just swap one problem for another. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But, but if that can hope locally within an organization. Yeah, and I, I know, yeah, and I know certainly t the teams within some of the member organizations actually have NFS shares where this goes on as part of their normal workflow. So yeah. it's something that the project, you know, and as Beth said, it's part of the auto builder cluster. So yeah, it's being, it's being actively used. Yeah, and then there are licensing concerns too, like, you know, they some have some processes in place where they cannot get feeds from outside for some reason. So um, speed is another issue. So like, that's what my next slide is. Um, say you don't want, you know, BitBake ever to access the network outside your, you know, s whatever you have defined your secure network. So uh, it has um, BB no network, one variable, you set it to one, and um, BitBake will look at your mirrors, it will never go out. And, um, um, so, and then there is, this is how you will define your source mirrors, and you have to cache the whole source mirror um, into your own mirror internally. And, uh, and then you can enable BB no network, and you're all set. Um, and uh, one of the Problems that you might run into this is uh, if you have like auto rev set on your you know internal recipes, um, it might not work because it will say oh I don't have any network access and I have auto rev to look into, and the fetch might fail. So essentially, um, you know you have to set the source revision to a certain Git SHA um, to fetch that internally. So uh, which is you know, the way it's, it's supposed to work, because if you have auto rev, then it's essentially looking out um, into the, into the net, outside the network, I think, for the recipe. 
Um, so given that, um, it will basically give, um, if you have uh, licensing concerns or something like that, that you want to maintain internal copies, you know, you might have some import process at your company, um, how to bring in packages from outside and, uh, you know, there are always um, legal escrow and stuff like that. You bring those things in, get them escrowed, and then you can reuse them all the time. So it helps, it helps in that process pretty much. Um, so, what file does that go into? Oh, you could put it into your uh, distro uh, configuration. Um, that's your distribution policy. Or uh, you could also put it in uh, your local.conf if you want to. Um, but essentially, you know, putting in your distribution policy makes it a lot clearer. Um, so, um, so the next thing is about online package management. We talked about um, generating uh, images and stuff like that. Um, so this is based on 1.3. Uh, with 1.4, it will change um, because we have uh, changed the front end for uh, um, the package management. So there are image features that we have, and one of them is package management feature. And if you want to create feeds and stuff like that, what you would do is you would go and add a package management into your image features. And uh, that should bring in all the necessary bits and pieces into your image. Um, that it should be then possible for your, uh, you know, image once you install on your device, um, it should be able to uh, run the package management. Um, so in 1.3 we had um, Zipper as a front end, and uh, this is uh, um, what it looks like. Is as I see, as I, as you can see, I've added a, a local feed that is um, internal. Um, so this is a um, zipper config that I want to adapt. So I define this as a, you know, my repo file, whatever you call it. And then I add all the zipper um, needed bits that are needed in there. Um, and then I hook it up into zipper. Um, so the next thing is um, we will just write the BBA pen for zipper. And uh, zipper will then include your... Um, um, your file, essentially your, uh, your repo description, into the into the image, and um, and there are actually very uh, nice documents on on Yocto Wiki how to set up your feeds uh, using um, uh, RPM and create repo, for example, and that's the other piece of it is that like now you need to maintain your feeds onto a feed server and. These are the changes you need on your device that it will look into your image server. So this is like if you don't want to modify your, um, your you know, image at all, and the image should always have a pre-built uh, feed paths in there. But these are also adaptable, like you can write, you can change those to um, any other uh, paths if you like on the device itself. Um, um, so I wanted to cover a little bit on multi-lib. Uh, multi-lib uh, allows us to have, uh, you know, 32-bit root file system and 64-bit root file system, for example, together. And um, um, for example, say, you know, you have um, um, two different architectures which are both multi-lib, for example, say, PPC64 and uh, x86-64. So I'm just covering that case. Um, what I've done here is uh, I have included, actually I've defined uh, multi-lib files which are depending upon default tune is a variable that's specific to an architecture. So what this will do is it will include the right one depending upon um, the architecture. So remember this is uh, our distro serving various, um, you know, multiple architecture BSPs. And uh, this um, include here uh, is instead of require because require will issue an error if it doesn't find the file. So for example, you know, you have a third architecture which is not multi-lib, right? You don't want to penalize that one. So if it doesn't find this file, then it just, it, it will not error and it will just pass on. So that's actually a subtle difference between include and require um, keywords of uh, bit-bake recipe syntax. So, um, 
just took advantage of that. So these are like, uh, you know, the the multi-lib configuration files that I defined. Uh, one of them is, for example, the 64-bit PowerPC. Essentially, it defines, you know, what the multi-lib libraries are and what is the architecture that your 32-bit counterpart is. So, for example, it's a E5500 32-bit for PowerPC and generic x86 for um, x86-64. And um, you could also define it has to be compatible, uh, so you know the best which which 32-bit uh, corresponding multi-lib goes with your architecture. Um, and um, um, that's uh, pretty much from user point of view how you will customize multi-lib um, and use it. Um, the packages that you would want to use start with this like lib32, right? So you have bash, for example, and you want 32-bit bash for some reason. The package would be called lib32-bash and lib32-something. So that's how you would include that into your images and stuff like that, if you have that use case. And uh, so the next thing is um, eglibc. So we have uh, actually. Um, use the customization features that are provided by eglibc so it can be tuned and uh, there are like two contrasting cases if you build Pocky, it uses it builds libc with all kind of features that are in there and um, there is Pocky tiny and Pocky tiny enables only few features and you can see the difference between size of say just the libc itself is um, is around 700k if you build it for pocky tiny if you build it for pocky it's about 1.3 1.4 meg in size so you know you can uh, serve into the areas where uc libc used to serve uh, not so much but uh, essentially it goes down pretty much uh, to like 700k a libc with that supports a lot of um, you know software on top so it's a pretty decent feature um, so there is distro features. libc is the variable that defines. So once you look, yeah. Um, I have a question relating to this and back to the shared state case. Uh, okay. State mm -hmm. So will that state case also keep two different builds of each libc and pulling the one that's in the currently selected distro, or is that one of these hard for the shared state question? I think you. Uh, I don't think it will. Like you know, it's it's per per architecture. So essentially, um, you have to um, have it once for. So those are two different distro if you look at it, right? So you have profiles based on those, and I think that you have to have separate kind of package feeds for both for safe state. Well, the, the, the configuration that went into that particular build is, is cached as part of the shared state checksum. So if you've configured this with a particular set of libc features, then it will preserve that in the checksum. And then if you change to a different set of libc features, it wouldn't pull that from the shared state if the checksum didn't match. Right, will it keep the old one, and if I change back? Yes. Effectively. Right. So once yeah. you populate that cache, you'll resolve all these different differences, whether you're building different distros, different architectures, the whole thing. It's designed right. to keep all of that stuff, yeah, so and, and handle it. That's one of the issues. You need to have some management of how that cache grows. Okay, so you, it's up to the user. Yeah. But what, what BitBait does do is it, it actually, um, if it's local-based, system, you know, if it's got access to the file system that it's on, then it will update the, the done stamps associated with these, and it will touch those stamps every time it uses them, so it gives you some idea of how actively it's being used. So that there's... Yeah. So there, there are some scripts also available, right, that looks into, like, uh, change state. That helps you with that. Um, so, uh, so distro features libc is actually what you can configure for uh, your small system if you want to customize it. And uh, 
uh, it's described in um, in extended sample configuration uh, the local.conf file you know take a look at that and um, uh, you can find more on what features you need and what you don't um, there are pretty invasive features some of them are like you know version management disabling version management so like in libc you have like three versions of printf right you, if you disable that your size drastically goes down but your compatibility goes down too so you know you choose what you want essentially um, okay so another thing is uh, say you know um, you can uh, create your own package groups um, which could be um, providing kind of a building blocks for your images and um, there are you can define your own there are already provided in Yocto metadata they may not be sufficient for you and uh, because Yocto metadata provides most common use cases and um, there might be certain specific use cases you have you can bundle them together into package groups it's pretty handy if you have like multiple images like you know you want to say have uh, certain features which are certain packages that are building up say you know a IPv6 and IPv4 and kind of things so you can ho have all those things in package groups and then you can just build your images using those package groups so it's very powerful in that regard and uh, you can also define conflicting features like SSH server open SSH or drop beer these are um, kind of uh, two features that provide um, same functionality and uh, so you could add depending upon what you want into your image features um, and you can define your own um, package groups too um, some of the uh, if you look under metadata there are a lot of um, you know available examples to to customize on uh, most of the times the better way that you know I figured out was to to use what's in the core and then add on top some of my own package groups that are needed you know that probably packages coming from different layers or your own layers and then you know thereby building up um, the different images that you have to build um, so by that I think I'm done